My name is Patrick Cotter. I'm the creative director of the Monster Literature Centre. Uh, this is the 18th short story festival I've curated. Um, the festival was founded in 2000, so this is the 21st iteration of it, uh, celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Our aim in establishing the short story festival was to try and redress that sort of uh, neglect and almost content for the short story form. And in the intervening 20 years, a lot has changed. You know, that there's a lot more institutional support for the short story. In Ireland alone, there's, you know, wonderful publishers like Steen fly through their journal and through their book uh, imprint. And they've, they've encouraged the short story a great deal. Um, in fact, uh, this year, already in Ireland, we've had uh, two marvellous anthologies published, um, by, both edited by people who are no strangers to this festival. Sinead Gleeson has just brought out a big hefty thing called The Art of the Glimpse. It's about three kilograms heavy, so it can double as a weapon of defence if you're ever facing home invasion. And Lucy Caldwell has edited the latest in a series of new Irish short stories uh, from Faber. Um, uh, and this one being various includes Daniel McLaughlin's uh, Sunday Times Audible Short Story Award winner. Um, more parochially, we have uh, an anthology from Cork City Library called Cork Words which includes uh, a lot of emerging writers along with uh, writers living in Cork with an international reputation, such as Billy O'Callaghan, Daniel McLaughlin, and William Wall. Um, we changed the name of the Short Story Festival a number of years ago because the other main aim of the festival was to um, reinstate the reputation of Frank O'Connor, who had been huge name uh, in the 60s and 50s. Uh, 1963, he was described by the BBC as Ireland's greatest living writer at a time when Samuel Beckett was living and working in obscurity in Paris. Um, and by the, by the 80s, um, himself and Ophé Lawn were being dismissed by the likes of Francis Stewart as bearing a relationship to the Irish free state analogous to that of the Soviet Writers' Union to the Soviet Union, which wasn't quite right because Fuelon and O'Connor, like many of the writers in Ireland at the time, faced huge censorship from the state. And uh, Cork City associated not just with those two writers, but also with Elizabeth Bowen and William Trevor. And because of that association Cork had with the short story genre that the Frank O'Connor Short Story Award was founded um, back in 2005. So tonight, anyway, we're, we're going to kick off the festival with two wonderful writers, both born in the mid-1970s. Um, Billy O'Callaghan has published five works of fiction already, uh, three collections of stories, two novels. Four. Sorry? Four collections. One novel. All right. And his, his latest is The Boatman from Jonathan Cape. And Simon Van Boy has published uh, two novels, three collections of stories, sorry, two novels for adults, two novels for children, and three volumes of practical philosophy. And he's produced a stage play and a short film. And the word love, I think, occurs in the title of about four of those uh, works. Um, so I'm going to ask Billy to start off by 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 reading a story, then Simon will read a story, and then we'll have, we'll have a chat. Right. Um, thank you, Billy. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, this is all a bit strange, but we'll make the best of it. Um, I'm going to read uh, half a story. Uh, I'm going to read a story from my most recent uh, book, which was the boatman, um, and I'm going to read a story called Wildflowers, um, a piece of a story called Wildflowers. Not very much happens in it. Uh, it's just a story about um, 
uh, a middle-aged man um, who visits his mother. Um, his wife is at home and she's she's not very well. Um, and it's a, I suppose it's a kind of a mood piece. Um, but it's a story I'm very fond of. So I'll just take it up uh, at a point where he has arrived into the house. He went through into the pantry, opened a cupboard in the corner and took out two of the small brown bottles from among the five that he'd tucked away the previous Sunday. He twisted off the caps, poured half of one bottle slowly into a tilted glass, then stood watching creamy froth rise from the cloudy golden red liquid. While the ale settled, he drained the remainder of the bottle in a couple of deep thirsty swallows, then picked up the glass and the second uncapped bottle and returned to the living room. The old woman had closed her eyes again. He stood a moment, then settled across from her in the other armchair. The only sound in the room was the tin stutter of the mantel clock, shocking seconds. And because something about the thick, cool seep of the light let him consider without needing to break down the defence of her own returning stare, he saw her more clearly than he had in the, in the longest time. I'm not asleep, she whispered after a minute or two in a voice almost too soft to catch. Don't worry, he said, I have my beer. The faintest hint of a smile tipped the corners of her mouth. I wasn't worried in the least about that. Her face this past couple of years had begun caving in around the prod of bone so that everything was becoming juts and hollows, her cheeks beneath their pointed ridges, her mouth between, uh, her mouth between her chin and long slender ridge of her nose. As long as he'd known her, she'd been thin, hawkish, he supposed, in the eyes of those who didn't know her softness. But now it seemed as if her bones were shrinking, leaving her skin baked to hide and cobwebbed with creases to sag in a mournful way. Don't stay long. Marta will be wondering where you are. Sure, she knows that if I'm not home, I'll be, I'll be either in the fields or up here. She'll not worry. The old woman watched him pull a mouthful of ale from his bottle. Except for the life in her eyes, the focus, she was little more than husk. The glass of beer, still to be tasted, rested on one knee. Uh, gripped in her left hand, its colour deepened by the shadows. Uh, Sorry, the light is very bad here. I'm just going to fix the, the light a bit. It's uh, a bit better, I think. Um, the old woman watched him pull a mouthful of ale from his bottle. Except for the life in her eyes, the focus, she was little more than husk. The glass of beer, still to be tasted, rested on one knee, gripped in her left hand, its colour deepened by the shadows. Apart from a skin of white foam across its surface, the burnt glassy brown of amber or old wood. How is she? Ah, she's grand, the same, you know. It hurts her a bit to swallow, and some nights she keeps me awake with her whistling. It's the goiter, she says. Her grandmother had it. Plenty of milk then, and periwinkles if she'll eat them. Tell her don't look further than the old cures. He and Marta were easy with one another. Love wasn't a word general, that generally entered their equation, though only because there'd been someone else a long time ago, and he found it hard to give away again what had already been given once and broken. But then he, he hadn't been Marta's first choice either, and in time they'd both come to understand that love wasn't everything. During the first few years, when so much had still been pos had seemed possible, they made the best of their situation. Having no illusions simplified matters. They were partners, sharing the workload, surviving together. And it was good to have someone. Over the years, they'd learned one another's ways and had grown comfortable with how the other filled space and affected the silence. Now, more than half a lifetime on, they rarely argued anymore. And routine gave them not only balance, but an identity. Sometimes, much more so during the early years of their marriage, but occasionally even still, 
lying awake in the small hours, each of them listening to the hushed draw of the other's breathing. It was easy to give in to the thoughts that kept them lit and lovely in such moments to take her into his arms and to let himself be guided in a way that met both their needs. The heart wants what it wants, but will often learn to settle for what it can get. He hit the bottom of his bottle unexpectedly and his thirst remained unquenched. There was beer left in the pantry, but the room's reverie was such that it didn't feel quite right to move. And so he remained in his armchair, gripping the bottle and trying to enjoy the coolness of its glass against his calloused pan. Across from him, the old woman's eyes were slipping relentlessly shut. Every few minutes, she, she struggled to revive herself, only to be soon or quickly dragged back down under another wave of drowsiness. I'm sorry. She cleared her throat and stirred a little. It's this weather. It has me beat. I can't seem to keep awake. You're lucky, he said. I haven't slept properly in weeks. There's, no, there's too much light out. And with Marta gasping for air alongside me, I can only lie there watching the window for the dawn. And I get to thinking, you know, about all kinds of things. That's the worst of it. I tell you, it makes the nights, it makes the short nights feel very long. A fresh wave of sleep broke and this time threatened to drown her. She went under and remained there, down at the bottom. In the armchair, she looked very small. Her feet, he noticed, tucked into square-toed shoes, the leather colour of bog turf, and with steel buckles that had years since lost their sheen, barely reached the linoleum. Nothing moved, and he found himself leaning forward in search of some hint, however slight, that would signal the continuance of life. The way he and Marta had, taking turns with the infant, Michael, all those years earlier. Not that it had made any difference in the end, because nights always kept a part of themselves hidden. And even if you succeeded in remaining awake, there were still oceans worth of things that got missed. He stared at the old woman and and for a while there was nothing to see but skin like tree bark and long silky wisps of hair whitened to translucence by the spill of light from the nearest window. But then her mouth clenched and her tongue flashed across her her thin lower lip. I dreamed of your father, she said, all night long. I closed my eyes and there he was, the way he always was of a morning after getting the fire lit, in his shirt sleeves and braces, his cheeks and chin dirty with a night's stubble. He turned on the wireless and we danced around the room, just like when we were first married, slowly, hardly moving, I feeling safe, small and safe in his arms, his body strong as a reef inside his clothes. I knew the whole time that it wasn't real, but it was so vivid I could smell the oil on his skin. And I didn't want it to ever end. When I finally woke, I wept because my mind had carried his voice in whispers back into the morning with me. It's just a dream. We all have them, even ones like that. I suppose. But they can leave such a mark. Honestly, I haven't been right all day. She shook her head and noticing the glass of beer, lifted it to her mouth and sipped. Fraud clung to her lip and the tip of her nose. Can't you go, boy? Marta will be will have a crust on your dinner, uh, trying to keep it warm. He sighed. All right, I suppose I better, but sure I'll be up along tomorrow, and Marta will give a call in the morning. Is there anything you need at all? Nothing for you to be fretting about. He hesitated, he hesitated then stood, stepped close to her and kissed her cheek. Her skin was cool and rough, not as he remembered. Bye, ma'am, he whispered against her ear. She closed her eyes again, and a smile deepened on her mouth. Bye, love, and don't forget to tell Marta what I said about the periwinkles. Tell her I said my boy is lucky to have the likes of her, even if, she does, even if he doesn't always know it. Outside, the evening seemed brighter than before golden and lazily alive, clotted with birdsong, 
The sky now was clear of cloud from age to age, and the warm mottled turquoise of a blackbird's eggs. He started back down the road. The slope made walking easy at first, but the gradual accumulation of gravity soon began to feel like a hand against his back. And wherever the stretch turned particularly steep, he had to fight from, uh, to keep from quickening into a run. To his right, wherever the ditches broke or dropped below eye level, he caught sight of the sea glittering in the sunlight. The blueness made him think again of Henna. She'd lived on the other side of the island, the land side, and at 15 and for a couple of years that followed before taking the boat to the mainland and then to England and from there to who knew where, she'd never missed an opportunity to hold his hand. He remembered her hair jagged as wind and her heavy lidded eyes, the Spanish colour of burnt dirt that clenched shut in laughter. And, from the, and for the better part of their teenage years, they'd walked together, danced in fields, kissed whenever they thought no one was looking, traded hopes and secrets, and made the best and most of any hidden places they could find. She left the way so many did, and once all hope of a return was lost, gone became the same as dead. But the ghosts lingered. The sight of, a, of the sea on a good day always made him recall her with a mixture of wonder and the old sadness. And if the bad days tended to heavily outweigh the good, then there was, there was still usually an hour or five minutes or a single heartbeat during which the sun would seep into view and keep memories alive. And there was the constancy of the water, the waves pulling towards the land to smash against the rocks and shore. Without thinking, he dropped to his haunches and began to pluck more wildflowers. Bees scurried among the foxgloves, so he gathered whatever came to hand. Harebell, columbine, snow, uh, cowslip, spools of honeysuckle, sweet violet. At home, there'd be a dinner waiting on a plate. Potatoes, cabbage, maybe a bit of mutton, and a bottle of something sweet to drink, cooling in a in a water bucket in the shade, and Marta. On days like this, he had, he had no appetite, though it would be nice to sit outside and wait for the light to fade. She'd wonder about the flowers, but wouldn't remark on them, except to smile. And if he kissed her, she'd kiss him back, probably laughing as they came together. In another month, he'd turn 50, and when he closed his eyes, it was as if the years had meant nothing in their passing. He could tell himself and believe that he was who he'd always been, in one breath an old man, in the next still very much a boy, and he kept his lasses close because time's barriers were soft. That's it. That was fantastic. Um, I... Uh had to commit double fly murder during your reading because uh, I've got the window open and the fleece flies were just tormenting me. Um, anyway, so um, I'm going to read a story uh, called The Fish. It's quite short um, and um, it's, uh, let's see, it, it's because actually Billy told me this story. Um, and uh, when I was last in, in Cork, um, and I stayed in that hotel that's supposed to be haunted, the one that used to be hospital, I think it is haunted. And Billy's mother told me stories that really creeped me out. Um, and, um, but anyway, Billy told me this story, I think the last time um, we had dinner. And Billy's one of those people who you can just sit there and not talk, and it is more intimate than talking with someone that you've known for years. So I really enjoy that and I miss that. Not post-COVID, Billy. I can't wait for our next meal together. Um, so this story is called The Fish and it's based on what Billy told me. <laughs> when my wife, Jenny, was calm enough to drive, she went to the school for our daughter. In the parking lot with the engine running, she explained what was going on. Helen bit her nails and stared at her shoes. It was just starting to rain. 
All she could do then was nod and listen to drops fall like the approaching footsteps of something small and invisible. After they drove the 30 miles to Wrexham Hospital. Halfway there, Jenny put the radio on, but when laughing voices filled the car, she turned it off. For weeks now, our youngest child, Daniel, had been begging us to let him walk alone to school. All his friends were doing it. He wanted to meet them on the corner before the bell was rung at the gates. I'd seen boys his age standing around eating and pulling at each other's backpacks then running away. Daniel wanted more than anything to be one of these boys. His school was only a half mile from our house, but there was a busy road to cross with buses and commuters heading for the ring road. I walked the route with him several times on Saturday, one Saturday, just to make sure he could judge the speed of approaching vehicles. He would most likely have to wait for a break than an empty road. Some parents had been petitioning for um, a crossing guard, but that didn't matter now. It was my wife's belief that going anywhere alone was important for Daniel's confidence. When we told him on Sunday night, he dropped the toy in his hand and leapt off the couch. But on the third day, he was knocked down. I sped to the hospital from my office. There were nurses in the intensive care unit waiting for me, but the doctor was in surgery with someone else's child. When I saw the state of my son, I felt tightness in my throat and a pushing behind my eyes that I now realized was grief hatching. He'd gone over the car and landed in a heap. His forehead was purple and black, like a dense plump storm that was refusing to break. His nose had been pushed to one side of his face and the skin on his cheeks was whiter than I'd ever seen it, almost translucent. I was told that he'd lost some teeth, but the real problem was uh, swelling on the brain. The nurses dragged a chair to his bedside. I felt certain I could wake him up just by touching his hand and whispering. A short time later, I met my wife and daughter outside. We made loops around the hospital garden because tests were being done and Daniel wasn't in his room. I tried to prepare them for how he looked and remember thinking that if our son died, that squashed eggplant nose and would be memory's first crude attempt to reconcile my desire for him. I let Jenny go in by herself. Then I took our daughter. I was very proud of Helen. She didn't cry, but sat down and asked if she could touch her brother's hand. A nurse lingered in the doorway. Can he hear us? Helen wanted to know. It's possible, said the nurse, that he knows the sound of your voice or that he's being touched. My wife was standing beside the window. When the nurse left us, she said it was good our son had his own room. I later learned it was only because he was expected to die. By late afternoon, both my wife and my daughter had spent several hours with Daniel, perched on either side of his body, cupping his limp hands. When I left the room to walk a little, I was told the doctor was back on the ward and wanted to see me. He was much older than I expected and wore a blue cotton shirt with a stethoscope in place of a tie. I was watching your wife and daughter in there. Yes, doctor, they've been like that since morning. Good, he said. Not everyone gets a chance to say goodbye. I remember an immediate blistering rage, but managed to keep my words steady. If you think it's hopeless, then you shouldn't be the attending physician to operate on him. The surgeon looked very tired then, as though he were compelled somehow to share a portion of the grief that passed through his hands. He was often the last person to be with a child, the one who wrote in the time, the day, and the location of where the death had taken place. I apologize, he said, if I gave that impression with your son, it certainly isn't hopeless. So what's next? Well, if there's no change by dawn tomorrow, I'd like to go in and do what I can, but very few people survive the surgery.
So what's the best case scenario? Well, that the swelling in his brain goes down by itself. Then he could wake up, doctor. Yes, but even then he may never wake up. We have a grief counsellor on staff and I can have a page at any time you want to talk. I think that would scare our daughter, I said. The doctor nodded. Yes, I understand. Are you religious? No, not really. Well, I was going to say there's an all-faith chapel on the fifth floor. I hear just being in there can be a great help. My wife and I took turns with Helen in the chapel so that neither of us would be alone. It was best for our daughter there because it was quiet and there were soft chairs where she could close her eyes. Daniel's school bag had been left at the roadside along with his shoe. The nurses had cut off his clothes and dressed him in a gown that buttoned at the back, but he was still wearing grey school socks. When it was my turn to be in there, I reached under the bedclothes and peeled them off. They were soft and they smelled like his unmade bed at home. I didn't want my wife or Helen to see the socks, so I put them in my pocket. After many hours, Daniel left for more tests. We tried to sit in the cafeteria, but the smell of food made us sick, so we all went to the chapel. Jenny and Helen sat down, but I wanted to walk around. The walls were decorated with small tapestries that looked medieval. I touched one. The fabric was coarse and worn, but some of the threads were still golden. Each piece looked valuable and should have been in a museum, but here they were in a small room on the fifth floor of a hospital in 1985, where people like me came to ask for help from forces they'd never truly believed in. There were no windows in the chapel. The air was cool and still, like in a real church. I wondered whose mouth and lungs had swirled the air, what was happening to them, and what they wished would happen. The animals sewn into the tapestries were strange, trance-like creatures with bulging eyes. Rabbits, mesmerised in a wood of black and green. In another, fish, like silver clouds, lingered at the surface of a pond while one broke the skin of water. I put my fingers on the fish's body, then its bright eyes, forced open by the weaver in perfect blindness. I followed the circular thread as though tracing an ancient path. When it got late, nurses came in to say goodbye. The evening shift was beginning. The doctor said we could go home for a while. There had been no change in Daniel's condition. Jenny was adamant that she stay overnight, so I agreed to take Helen back. I would be contacted before surgery began, then return to hospital when it was over, sometime tomorrow morning. I'd be able to speak with my wife any time, the nurses said. Halfway home, I noticed Helen in the back seat, sobbing. I couldn't say what I wanted because her brother was probably going to die if he wasn't dead already, in his brain, that is. How about those tapestries, I said. She looked up. In the chapel, did you see them? She turned to the window to raindrops filled with light from passing cars. You're trying to distract me. There was one with rabbits, Helen. Did you see that? No, Helen said. But I saw fish jumping out of the river. I thought it was a pond. No, Dad, it was a gushing stream. Who made them? Don't know. Something on the wall said they were donated after the war. When we were almost back, I told Helen she should try and eat something. But Dad, I'll stop at the chip shop. Would you eat chips? She looked at her hands. I could try. When we got home, I waded through the darkness of each room, turning on the lights. Then I sat Helen at the kitchen table with the bag of chips and released the aroma of vinegar and salt. Steam rushed upwards from the food like ghostly arms. Helen stared without touching anything, then asked permission to go upstairs and take a shower. I wrapped her supper and put it in the oven next to mine. I wasn't hungry either, but knew I would need sustenance to keep a clear head over the next several hours. It occurred to me then how often we'd sat at the kitchen table 
as a family and how we would never do it again in the same way. Outside the kitchen window, night was so deep, forces of light had sketched my face and body on the glass as though I were being remembered. A bit later, when Helen was in bed, I sat at the end of the mattress until her eyes closed and long breaths rode her out to sleep. Then I crept downstairs and took the package of fish and chips from the oven. It was still warm. I carried it into the sitting room and sat down. Unwrapping the paper, I remember very clearly being surprised by the size of the fish that lay atop the chips. It was thick and heavy with a crispy coating of batter. But as I cut into it, something came hurtling down the chimney and landed with a thud in the hearth. It was months since we'd lit a fire and the grate had not been cleaned. The impact of the falling object down the chimney sent a cloud of ashes into the room, showering the carpet with bits of charred wood and chalky fragments of coal. I shoved the food off my lap and rushed over. As I leaned into the fireplace, the object suddenly flipped itself over. Then I heard Helen's bare feet on the stairs and saw her startled face in the doorway. Her eyes were very wide. When it moved again, she screamed. At first, we couldn't tell what it was because of the soot and the ashes, but when it flopped several times, twisting its body in the air, we realised. Quick, I said, go upstairs and run a bath of cold water. Helen was still staring, but how did it get in the fireplace? I don't know, but I'll find something to carry it and meet you upstairs. Without thinking, I pulled Daniel's socks from my pocket and put them on my hands. My feet made black prints on the carpet from where I trembled in the splayed ash and burned pieces. That didn't matter now. The creature was somehow still alive. Once snug in my grasp, it would be for several moments very still, then like a single muscle flex its packed body. Upstairs, I dipped my hand in the bath to check the temperature, then lowered the bundle to cold water. For a moment, it just floated under the socks. But when Helen reached in with her fingers, the silver body came to life and darted forward to where clear water was churning into the tub. Are those Daniel's socks? Helen asked. I couldn't speak or look up to meet her eyes. Good idea, Dad, she said, touching my hand. The white stool Daniel stood on to clean his teeth was under the sink. Helen pulled it out and we sat down, transfixed by the fish, moving its tail in a slow, rhythmic motion against the pummel of dropping water. Helen kept asking, how is it possible? And at one point, she even got up and opened the bathroom window, as if they were falling everywhere, upon the leaden streets and the silent cars licked with dew, the green verges, heavy in the fields and on the hills, flopping on the motorways, the bridges, the sharp, wet roofs of a sleeping world. She opened both windows and we listened. Just a light rain, falling in a steady pattern, barely grazing the silence of night. We sat together for a long time, Helen and I, holding hands, watching the fish, as at any moment it would disappear, and we'd wonder how, for a few moments, such a magnificent creature had been alive with us in the same house, sharing our lives. Eventually, Helen's eyes started closing and I helped her into bed. Then I stood in the bathroom doorway and looked at our fish in the clear muscle of bath water. I told Helen we would find a river or a pond on the way to the hospital. If Daniel had been with us, he would have stayed in the bathroom all night. He would have stayed on the white stool watching the fish, telling it things about the world he believed were important. Then I saw his toothbrush. The sound of it in his mouth would be something I would try and hold on to. I left the light on and went downstairs. The sitting room was a mess where I trodden ash and burned pieces into the carpet and there were sooty marks like the footprints of strangers going in and out. But such things didn't matter anymore. I still wasn't hungry and my supper was now cold. 
I sat and pulled the bundle back onto my lap, staring sadly for some time at the golden batter. Eventually, I reached for my knife and fork, though as I cut through the hard, crisp shell, I discovered an empty cavity with no fish inside. I felt my breathing quicken, and in my chest, the small, quick smashing of my heart. Then the, suddenly the phone rang. I tossed the bundle of food to one side and rushed to the hall table. It was my wife. Daniel had woken up just a few moments before and was asking for water. The doctor was there and nurses were gathering outside. Nothing like this had ever happened and there was great excitement. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. You recently drove from New York to California. Yeah. And you had a reason to, you had a specific reason for why you drove rather than took the plane. Would yeah, you mind I mean, briefly sharing that reason? Uh, because I have, a, I have a sick mouse and um, he couldn't be alone. So he's here actually, if you want to meet him. Come on, that's it. There he is. See? He's a bit poorly. He, um... he looks quite sleepy now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is his time for sleeping, but he also has a... Uh, he has a... a rescue mouse, is he? Huh? He's a rescue mouse. Yeah, he is. He was going to be fed to a snake. Um, you know, I know snakes have to eat, but in the wild, at least they have a chance to escape, you know. But when you put the mouse in the tank, I think it's, a, well, for me, I consider it cruel. It's legal in America, unfortunately, like many things. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, he's a, it's amazing how much love such a small creature can receive and give. Yeah. You see, Simon, so, mean, the reason I asked you to share that story is because, for me, it's a perfect illustration of your own individual, unique character and personality. And I believe that character and personality informs, you know, the, 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 fi the worldview of your fictional universe. And, you know, I, I know your story of choosing to drive, spend days driving across the continent rather than take a plane in order to facilitate a mouse. It, it, it's a sincere story. But if I hadn't engaged with you on and off over the years at this festival, I might be like St. Thomas and doubt without having had the opportunity to insert my hand into the wound. I mean, living in a country where there's so much violence and where public discourse is so toxic at times, mm. do you ever encounter cynicism and incredulity from people you, you talk to about, about these things? Or, or are you careful whom you talk to about these things? Um, I try to talk to to be honest. Um, because um, unless you have a fanatical view, um, you're not taken seriously. So, um, you know, if I wrote an essay about a mouse, um, you know, the, I, nobody would really be interested over here at the moment because the, the sound of the shouting on both sides, you know, is so loud that the small, small things in life get drowned out. But for me, the value of life is in small things. So. Uh, I'm just keeping uh, a low profile. I mean, I'll stand up and defend somebody you know, against tyranny or, or, or racism, you know, if I have to with my, you know, but um, I'm not going to get involved in a Twitter debate. It's just, it seems to me, you know, so um, I'll just keep writing stories, I think, and looking yeah. after rodents. Uh, there's so much pressure on writers in America these days to get involved in public issues. I mean, do you, do you feel your development and livelihood as a writer is affected by that at the moment? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, and in fact, um, I definitely think that, um, I think that uh, there is a, you know, writers are, they're not forced to, to, to have a political angle in their fiction, but it's encouraged, I think. Uh, just because, I don't know, I mean, because nobody likes horrible people, nobody likes 
racist, you know, people. But the thing is, I always feel like people who are horrible, who are abhorrent, I, I like the um, Asian view that, you know, that they're suffering and that, you know, by just simply the only way to help them is to somehow embrace them in a weird way. But that's not a fashionable view. <laughs> yeah. Before I draw Billy into the discussion, one other question I want to direct specifically at you is, um, like Ian Lee, many of your stories are inspired by actual news reports and from anecdotes you hear from other people. Um, you know, in, in explaining to uh, an emerging writer or a curious reader, um, what creative steps do you take to transform a story with a factual basis into uh, a create uh, an artistic fiction? Mm, good question. Well, I try and remove as much of myself from the process as possible. Um, Billy told me that story about the fish and I couldn't, I couldn't see his face while I was reading and I was dying to because I wanted to see if he would laugh. Because <laughs> he told me the story about a fish coming down his chimney while he was eating fish and chips on the settee. Is that true, Billy? You don't remember? <laughs> That's weird. Are you sure you didn't tell me that story? Okay. Um, oh. If if I did tell you it, I told you a lie because you, you <laughs> should know, you should know better than to believe me. But if you get a story um, out of it, that's okay. I've got. I've, Billy's told me three stories that I have turned into stories that I put in books. Um, so, like, if I ever don't have any inspiration, or if I ever Billy's like writer's block in the dictionary has a picture of Billy next to it. Just go find Billy, um, which is humbling because, you know, he, I admire his work so much. Um, but turning stories into stories, um, I think that um, often, I, often the story I want to tell is not one that I think I want to tell. So it's like uh, when you think you want uh, a curry, but actually when you sit down to write, you find out that you want lasagna. And so thankfully though, in the writing process, lasagna appears and then you eat it. Uh, so I feel like uh, I don't make very good decisions myself when it comes to writing, but if I can sort of get rid of myself, forget myself and just trust the process, um, then things usually work out okay uh, if I don't mess it up with editing. So it's very intuitive, really, Pat. Great. Billy, um, you've had a very unusual career development path. You published your first stories in a free newspaper, which is basically hardly more than a parish newsletter in Douglas, way back in the beginning of the century. And I believe you submitted your manuscript your first manuscript, the Mercier Press, because basically they were the publisher whose offices were just down the street from where you lived. You really hadn't any understanding of, uh, you know, the place of Mercier Press in, in, the, in, the, in the industry or what it meant to submit a manuscript to them as distinct from anybody else. You've got to where you are today without ever having an agent. Do you, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, like, presumably you must have learned a lot. You must have, must be able to look yeah. back at your early self now as somebody who's quite naive and innocent, do you? Um, well, I, I, I actually published my first story in the Hollybo, um, which, which, which for people outside Cork is a is an annual publication uh, which comes out at Christmas and includes a lot of uh, memoir type stories and local history type stories from from. Um, not prof not professional writers, not mm. bad writers either, but not professional ones. Yeah, um, and uh, when I, when I published that story, that was the height of my ambition. It really was. I, I and uh, I I had been writing stories, and um, I published something in Southward along the way. I published in in lots of different places, but I had no idea that there were differences 
I thought one place was the same as the next. You know, you send your story out and it's accepted or rejected, usually rejected. Um, and um, at one point, I, I had been writing for a magazine in Douglas. Um, it was a free ads magazine and I would write little filler articles. And uh, I, <clears throat> I was surplus to requirements. There was a change in ownership. And <clears throat> I had published maybe about... Um, maybe about 20 stories or so. Uh, and quite a few of them had, had been published in, in the US uh, at that point. Um, and I, when, I, when I found myself out of, out of work, I, I decided, look, I have all these stories. I better try to do something with them. So I put them in an envelope <clears throat> and I walked down to um, Mercier Press, their office, which which was in Douglas Village, and um, their office was actually above the betting office, and I was going to the betting <laughs> office anyway, so um, so I just put it in the letterbox, um, and about a year and a half later, I got a phone call to say that they were going to publish, which turned out to be my first collection, um, uh, and yeah, along the way, I I ha- I'll have to correct you, I, I actually have had a couple of agents over the years didn't really work out for me, you know. Um, I, I think agents are a hard one to, to figure out because there's millions of them. And it's a bit like there's millions of places to publish stories. But you need to find the right agent. You need to find the right magazine for your story or the right publisher for your story. Um, and likewise, you need to find the right agent that's, you know, because anybody can just say they're an agent and you know, and call themselves one. So um, I just, I, I stumbled along uh, making every mistake you can make over a 20-year period. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I, I never had any expectations. Even even now when I, when I start to write a, a new story, I never really believe anybody is ever going to read it. I, I'm just writing it because it's it's got to that point where it has to be written, um, and uh, so I, I never had any expectations, and so I never had any kind of a plan, you know. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I I left school after my leave insert, um, and that was about two years too late for me because I would have come out earlier if I could have. Um, so I was about seventeen. Um, and I, I just had no interest in that side of, you know, I was never suited to school or uh, that that side of, of life. Um, and I, I just I just stumbled along and I, 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 I would publish stories. And as time went on, my stories started to get better and they started to get accepted by better publications, you know. Um, uh, but it, it's still a surprise to me, you know. I mean, when I when I write the stories, I, I write them and I work on them, um, and I I'm I'm very slow to let them go, you know. Maybe in the last five or six years, once I once I'm writing them, I, I keep at them until I I'm really happy with them, and then I I send them out. Um, w- once they turn a corner from being awful to when they start to become what I want them to be, uh, I, you know, at that point, then I'll start to consider maybe this will be okay to send out into the world. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's been trial and error every step of the way. Um, and just eventually... But it's it certainly worked for you, Billy, because, I mean, you, you've gone from the Hollybow and Douglas Newsletter to Saturday mm-hmm. Evening Post and Plowshares and being shortest of the cost to a short story award and mm. all this whatever doing an MA or an MFA in, in creative writing like 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 most Irish writers prior to the most emer- to the most recent emerging generation yeah. I guess. Um, I mean one of the advantages that the live short story festival has over the online short story festival is the collegial atmosphere of the, mm. of the festival, the sociability factor. Um, Writers have a chance to meet meet each other, one another, and strike up friendships. And I know that yourself and Simon, um, you know, formed a very enduring and 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 uh, 
mutually, mutually beneficial friendship through the Short Story Festival. So yeah. I wanted you both to talk about, you know, how important that relationship was to each of you as, as creative individuals and, and also how useful uh, a collegial and sociable festival can be to, to a creative writer, you know? Right. Um, I, I, I suppose um, the first thing I'd say is that in, in my experience, uh, the, the, the short story, this short story festival, the Cork one, used to be the Frank O'Connor Festival. Um, I haven't really seen that quite the same in other festivals, you know. They're, they're, they're not as um, completely engaging. Um, I, I was in. I was at the Edinburgh Festival last year, um, and uh, y- you're you're very much on your own. You know, you you do your thing and you you go and and that's it. And just you know, there's not the same interaction with people. Um, I got a I got a message yesterday. I was after putting something up about this this event, uh, and I got a message yesterday from um, Liesl Jobson, who was at the who read at the Short Story Festival in 2009, the year that Simon won the the prize, and um, she said, uh, she said, oh, it's only been a few days since um, I was at your parents' house for a fry up. Uh, say hello to Simon for me, and and I remember that that was 2009. That was the first time we met, and. Um, we were I I can't remember, it must have been the last night, I think, uh, and we were we were in a pub or we were somewhere and I got the bright idea to say to people, Come come on out to my my mother will you know put on a <laughs> pen of sausages and rashers for us and black pudding. Um and she did. And um so there was um, there was a group of us came out and we ended up chatting I, I'd say it must have been tr- true most of the night because a lot of the, the the few of the people that were there were flying out early the following morning and they had to get from my, my mother and father's house to their hotel to collect their luggage to go straight to the plane. So, you know, that I don't know if you if you get that at a lot of festivals. Um, Cork is a, it was a much more inclusive one, I think, than that. That's my experience of it anyway. I think it might be helped by the fact that we've never had a green room. We've never had a green room where the writers are sequestered off from the audience. The, the yeah. writers get to drink in the same space as the audience members themselves, you know, and yeah. we try to have a kind of a, you know, a level democratic atmosphere. Of it. Yeah. It's, Simon, in America, they have the term good literary citizenship for, to describe, um, you know, positive and, uh, beneficial relationships between writers. Uh, is that what you, is that what you developed with, with Billy? And, and, and you know, I've, I've seen Billy grow immensely as, as a writer and as an artist since he got to know you personally. And wondering how you might have benefited from that, that friendship as well. Um, yeah. So I think I, I, the three I, stories out of, out of Billy. Um, the, the friendship with Billy is um, is rooted in the, I think, in the fact that we both uh, simply just want to tell good stories that, you know, have an effect on a person's emotional landscape. Um, so, you know, Billy and I have both had our fair share of the business and, you know, you know, signings and, and readings and all kinds of things. But Billy and I both know if it's okay, Billy, that I say that, that at the end of the day, you're sitting down at home faced with a a blank piece of paper and a feeling, a gnawing feeling that, you know, that glove you saw on the bus is, is important and it's going to become important. And now you have to begin the torture of trying to fish it out, fish out that feeling and into a story. And so, um, you know, you quickly realize after you publish a book that publishing is like, it's important because, you know, you can make some money and you also, people get to, it connects you to the readers, but you also have to go through um, tunnels of business and things like that, you know, because the people who publish books don't necessarily, it's not like, um, I know Declan is here and 
and the stinging fly, the purpose of the stinging, stinging fly, in my opinion, is to just, it's like, a, it's like medicine. I know a stinging fly isn't usually medicine, but um, it's medicine. I mean, short stories to me are medicine. It's not escapism. Um, it, in fact, it's the opposite. It's a deeper experience of yourself. And I think a lot of people are afraid of that, you know? Um, so, because it's terrifying to be faced with yourself. <laughs> like being alone is, you know, it's like sometimes it's being like, like locked in a room with your worst enemy. So, um, but for Billy, I, for, it, that idea that, um, that's that, that, that short stories are a kind of emotional medicine without trying, you know, just seeing what comes. I think that having Billy makes it feel less lonely when I'm writing. Like I picture Billy in his apartment, sorry, Billy, in his pajamas or, you know, and he's just, I'm here and he's there and we're both just doing the best we can until we die. And so that, I think that's very comforting to know Billy's out there in his PJs. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that, um, having Simon imagining me in my pyjamas, but uh, especially since I don't own pyjamas. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I suppose, uh, I, I think it's about the work. I, I, I think it's, um, you know, th there's, there's a lot of people writing short stories now. Um, in we had a thousand, over a thousand people enter for the, the Sean O'Fallon um, prize just just recently. Uh, there was another the, um, there was another prize that the radio had, and they had four thousand entries um, for a short story. So that means there's four there's at least four thousand people in Ireland writing short stories at the moment. Um, I wish there was four thousand readers. We might have a chance of selling a few books, but um, <laughs> uh, it's um, it, you know it's uh, even you know when you when you know that the story is going to go out into the world, you, you're still in your little space, um, mm. and uh, you know the with, we've had the lockdown and um, cocooning and all that sort of thing, and I've been in, I've been cocooning for years this this isn't a, isn't a huge um it's not a huge test for me at all uh in fact it, in in some ways it's it's been beneficial because at the moment I'm, I'm writing about somewhere around 12 hours a day and i have been since march um and i'm uh, i i like when i finish here i'll write until i'll write for another four or five hours before i before I pass out, probably, um, and it's that's really what it's about. It's great to to just, you know, to to when you have something that you need to write, and you, you know you you don't want anything to get in the way of it, um, but at the same time, it's it is nice to to have a few people that you know that you can, if if you have to, or if you if you feel the need to kind of reach out and touch. A human being somewhere in the world, you can send an email that you, somebody that will know that will have the same um, the, the the same problems as yourself or the same issues, um, and so that that's one of the benefits I think of 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 knowing a few other a few other writers. I mean, I, I I've met quite a few writers over the years, and some of them I would never want to be in the same room with again. You know, so it it's a personality thing. It's it's who you connect with and who you don't. Um, and I'd say when when Simon and I would get together, it would be we we would tell one another stories or we would chat, but we probably wouldn't really get into the into the bones of of writing and submitting and agents and publishing and all that kind of thing. Um, that's that's something for somebody else to deal with almost, you know. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Pat, but. I, 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 my, my own experience with poets is that when they get together they talk about the material from which poems are made rather than about poetry itself, you know. Um, I, the, I can't I, hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, I was saying my experience of uh, poets is that they, when they get together they talk about the sort of stuff that goes into poems rather than about poems and poetry themselves. Mm. Um, 
we have time for maybe one more question with each of you before we need to wind up before the next event starts. Simon, you, you've published 10 books or more now at this stage. And like most writers I know, um, it's, it's not enough for you to make a living from and sustain a family. A writer these days seems to need to, um, you know, uh, have several streams of income. One of yours is, is teaching people privately. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that process? How, 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 how you, uh, in, you know, engage with these people, how they come to you and, and what's involved in you teaching a, an individual privately? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It is, it is very hard to, um, to make a living, especially living in New York, New York City, you know, where life just keeps rising up to meet you um, and having a family. Um, and also what I choose to write is not particularly, is not commercial. So, um, if I was somebody, you know, said, why don't you write this or that, you know, just treat it like a job. But the fact is, if I wanted to do that, I would have gone into something else, you know, retail. I don't know. But so the way I see it is if I'm good, I want to write the stuff I want to write. And if it sells, it sells. If it doesn't, it doesn't you know, I'll work at McDonald's or whatever, I don't mind, but, you know, the idea of writing what is not you, it seems to me a total waste of life. So, um, um, in fact, I'd rather even sell my books to somebody who wants to be a writer and put their name on it because it's, I just want to write. Yeah, you know, it's almost like an obsession. Um, so, anyway, I'm just putting that out there in case anybody, before I put the books on anybody. Um, but um, yeah, the teaching, um, I, it's something I really, really enjoy. I, I taught at a university on and off, um, not writing, but linguistics and um, some sort of entry level philosophy classes, not because of the students, but because of me, I can't deal with anything beyond entry level <laughs> philosophy, it's too hard. Um, so, uh, and then, but I teach, I've been teaching people over, for a few years now, uh, helping them with their books. And um, sometimes there's somebody I just, um, people will write to me and they'll say, I'm working on something or I want to write a book. Um, I work with about four or five people a year and one person's in, in Germany, one person's in um, South Korea, uh, one person was in the Middle East. So everyone's in, you know, someone in Los Angeles uh, and everybody's written a different, writing a different kind of book. But I really, really enjoy being an editor. So everything that my editors have taught me over the last 10 books, I now have that experience and also from being a writer myself. So, um, you know, some of the books I've worked on have gone on and, you know, they've, they've really had an impact, I hope, in people's emotional lives. Um, and, uh, you know, one book I'm working on now, I think, is going to really help a lot of people who've been living with these sort of dark secrets. And so I work on fiction and nonfiction from like, so, some like medical inspired books to uh, the story of a girl from South Korea growing up in Texas in the eighties, which was a lot of fun to write, uh, to edit. Um, and, um, you know, I work, I work with each person about three, four hours a month and I'm editing and we chat for an hour on WhatsApp or something like that. And it works pretty well. The only problem is when people disappear, it's like people who hire a personal trainer and they don't show up at the gym. So that's a bit tough, but I have to say most of the people I work with, you know, they really do the three, they do all the writing and they submit. And after a year, most of my, the people I work with have books. You know, they have a finished first draft. Right. Um, which, and actually the question I want to put to Billy before we wind up is his experience of editing. And, you know, you know you've been published by Irish publishers and now by Jonathan Cape, you know, one of the most prestigious, uh, international fiction imprints. And Billy, I mean, is there a quantum leap in the experience, in the, in the difference between the experience being edited by an Irish publisher and, 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 and by a publisher like Jonathan Cape? I know Declan Mead's Steam Fly is probably an exception in the, in the Irish uh, landscape of publishing. But, but you know, was there, a, was there a huge difference in experience for you, Billy? Um, well, so far I've had two books with um, with Janet and Cape, uh, this collection of stories and the, the my previous novel, which was um, My Coney Island Baby. Um, and 
there was very little editing really needed to be done with the stories because a lot of them had been published in magazines, you know, um, and so they were to a to a certain um, standard. Uh, there there were probably some things that the repetition was the was the main thing with that. Uh, as far as with Coney Island, uh, the Coney Island novel, um, I'd spent seven years writing it, and I'd rewritten the thing multiple times. Um, I I'd gotten to a point where I had printed out the entire manuscript, and I had cut out every paragraph in single space font blue tacked the entire novel to the the eaves of my mother's attic <laughs> uh, attic wall and edited piece by piece over a, a period um and this was after i had this was on the seventh year when the the thing was driving me insane um and it was only at that point that i could kind of feel it was finished so when when jonathan cape took the took the book then it was um uh Robin Robertson was was my editor, um, who has since been shortlisted for the Booker Prize a couple last year, I think, or for his own book. Um, but uh, with that book, there was, I think, there was maybe two sentences needed to be edited. Um, but I'm not sure that that's a normal, a normal situation. Okay, it doesn't sound like that to me. No, yeah. So again, it, it well, shows you how how much how hard you've worked in. How much you yeah. developed a self video feed? Well, I, I suppose you know when I think of th- that book um, and and these these stories, they, they were they were bought together um, by Janet and Cape, and I, I wonder if they would have taken them if they had been any less polished than they were. Yeah, which is another another thing that people probably should try to keep in mind. You, you need to do it as much as possible yourself, I think, before you you send it out into the world. Um, now, having said that, I have a novel coming out in January um, with with Cape, um, and that needed needed editing a, a bit more because it was a bit more unwieldy. Um, uh, the editing was was very much left to me, it, but every but they kept pushing me to edit it again and edit it again. You know, they they kept saying, "Well, the pace is off at, in the first section," or you know, um, and um, it was, you know, the Irish. My experience with the Irish editing scene, the the, the Irish publishers was, again, it's hard to judge because it was short stories. Um, and they had been published. A lot of them had been published previously, but there was there was very little. There was design, maybe, you know. Yeah. Um, the the editing with with Cape, it's much more. You you really get the feeling they want the book to be the very best that it can be, and you know they're they're pushing you to make it as as good as it can be, um, which is great. I mean, you know, that's all you should really yeah. want you know so yeah. okay well we've, we've far from exhausted our topics yeah. conversation but we, we've run out of time now before we need to make space for the, the next event i'd like to thank both billy and simon who've joined us from different time zones and extreme opposite parts of the globe here tonight as have many of the audience i'd like to thank all of you for having turned up as well um one, one thing i'd like to say before I close this opening session of the 20th uh, anniversary festival is that many other short story festivals have begun and ended during that period. And I think well, what's made the Cork International Short Story Festival a sustaining festival has been the high support we've received from Cork City Council and the Arts Council. And, and really their support is, is crucial was going on from year to year, I'd like to publicly thank them. And I'm hoping to see many of you again in 15 minutes when Danny <laughs> Denton does my job far better with Edgar Corrett and Uji Gartner. So thanks all of you. Take care now. Thanks, Pat.